Commissioner, as I said, the next witness is Mr Philip Kewen, K-E-W-I-N. Mr Kewen, would you uh, wish to be uh, sworn or would you prefer to make an affirmation? Uh, sworn, Commissioner. Would you be good enough to stand then? I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give will be the truth will be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mr. Kewan. Do sit down. Yes. May it please your honour, I appear for Mr. Kewan. Mr. Kewan, could you state your full name? Philip Michael Houston Kewan. And are you the chief executive officer for the Association of Financial Advisers Limited? Yes, I am. And have you received a summons to appear to give evidence and produced a signed witness statement today? Yes, I have. I tender that document. Uh, the summons to Mr Kewan will be Exhibit 2.229 and then uh, the statement, perhaps, if he'd be good enough to confirm its truth. Yes, Your Honour. Uh, is your business address 255 Clarence Street, Sydney? Uh, 257. 257. Sorry, Mr Kewan. And um, have you, uh, do you have, have you prepared a witness statement in answer to questions asked by the Royal Commission in yes, Rubric 223? And do you have your witness statement with you? Yes, I do. And do you affirm, the, uh, swear the truth of that statement? I do. I tender that statement together with the exhibit. Exhibit 2.230 will be the witness state of Mr Kewan and its uh, uh, exhibits. Yes. Yes, that's all, Your Honour. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, that's all. Mr Kewan, you've been the CEO of the Association of Financial Advisers, or the AFA, since March last year. That's right. And what was your role before you became the CEO of the AFA? Uh, before that, I was General Manager of Life and Investments at Zurich Financial Services. You say in your statement that the AFA originated as the Life Underwriters Association mm -hmm. of Australia and New Zealand in 1946. Yes. Uh, so at that time its members were all life insurance salesmen? Basically, yes. And the Life Underwriters Association of Australia and New Zealand then changed its name to the AFA in 1994? Yes, that's right. Uh, because by that time, you tell us in your statement, its members were providing advice not just uh, they were not just selling life insurance, but they were providing advice about insurance, trauma, superannuation, savings and investments. Yeah, well, our membership base changed so that we have advisors who provide holistic advice and still have members who are advisors providing specialist advice in some or all of those areas. And does that change reflect the evolution of the financial advice industry more generally, beginning as an industry concerned with the sale of insurance products and expanding to cover advice about other products? Absolutely. And do you think that the origins of the financial advice industry in the sale of insurance products contributed to the industry having a strong sales culture in the past? Uh, yes, I do. And do you think the industry still has a strong sales <coughs> culture? Uh, it depends on what you view as sales. Well, what do you view as sales? I view, as, I view as sales as analysing a customer's needs and providing a solution for those needs. And selling a product in the process? There may be a product in the process. Um, so do you accept that the industry still has a sales culture? I believe there is an element of sales culture in the industry, yes. Do you see financial advisors as being part of a profession or an emerging profession, Mr Kewan? I think the majority of customers who have advisors would see their advisors as professionals. I think it is a profession. I don't think it's perceived as a profession, but I do believe it's a profession. Sorry, I think you said that your that customers would see the advisors as professionals. Yes. And then you said you don't think it's perceived as a profession. Who is it not perceived as a profession by? I think there's a lot of people who don't have financial advisors and don't seek financial advice. And so, unfortunately, based on things like what we've seen over the past couple of weeks, have a perception that all advisors are not professionals, whereas I don't believe that. So you think some financial advisors are professionals? I believe the majority of financial advisors are professionals. And what makes them professionals? I believe that they act in the interests of their clients, they act with integrity and professionalism. 
They analyse the needs of their clients. They provide solutions for them. They provide financial security and they provide emotional security. And I know when emotional security is hard to measure in terms of professionalism, but that's what a financial advisor does. You heard me ask this question, I, I suspect, of Mr Degori, but do you think people trust financial advisors in the same way that they trust other professions uh, like doctors or lawyers? I believe the majority of people who have, who have financial advisors trust them in the same way as they do doctors and lawyers. So they place that same sort of trust in financial advisors? Yes, I believe so. It's people who have financial advisors. I'm sorry? That is, people who have financial advisors place that trust in those financial advisors. And do you think financial advisors discharge that obligation of trust? Um, no, I don't believe so. I'm not sure if I understand your question. Do they act in a trusted way? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, when the Commission asked you to uh, provide a witness statement, Mr Kewen, you were asked what the AFA sees as being its key functions and purposes. Mm -hmm. And in response to that question, you provided the full list of the functions of the AFA as set out in its constitution. Yes. Um, from that full list of functions, what do you see as being the key functions of the AFA? There are, there are a number of key functions of the AFA. I mean, the, the primary function of the AFA is to promote the value of financial advice. The output of that is in doing so in the, the best interest of the customer, in the public interest. So in, providing, in promoting the value of financial advice, that can be done so through many of the other objects, including increasing education standards, professionalism, integrity, and providing a community for advisors to learn from others, learn ethical behaviour and learn best practice. One of the functions you've identified in your witness statement is to promote ethical practice, exercise oversight over professional standards of members and support and protect the character, status and interest of the financial advice profession generally and the professional standing of members. Yes. Uh, how long has that uh, function been in your constitution? Um, I think we added that to the Constitution in October last year. Why was it added? We reviewed our Constitution uh, because it was time to look at the Constitution, what the objects and what the objects of the AFA were and make sure that it was satisfying what we believe uh, were the needs of, of um, the profession and the needs of the, uh, the customer and the general public. Another of the functions that you identify is acting as a co-regulator with regulatory authorities and statutory bodies in relation to your members and engaging in regulating and promoting activities to support this role. That was added into the objects to enable us to facilitate the journey to becoming a code monitoring scheme under the Financial Sta Advisor Standards and Ethics Authority. To facilitate the journey to you becoming a... Code monitoring body, a code monitoring scheme. So that's another one that was added in in October last year? That's right. Do you think that the AFA currently performs the role of a co-regulator in the finance financial advice industry? No. Um, uh, it's more of an aspirational statement, is it, that function? It is a, a statement to enable us to move down that path, yes. What role would you like to see the AFA play in the regulation of the financial advice industry? Well, as is currently proposed under professional standards, uh, the Financial Advisor Standards and Ethics Authority will, will appoint code monitoring schemes and code monitoring bodies and it's our intention to be a code monitoring scheme. Do you think it's important for industry associations to play a role in the regulation of the financial advice industry? To the extent that they're able to, yes. Why? Uh, I think it's important that we collaborate to ensure that, um, that the consumer interests are looked after. So what role can industry associations like the AFA perform that ASIC and financial services licensees can't? In terms of regulation at the moment, uh, there's not a lot. Uh, in terms of regulation, in terms of the complaints procedure, 
the standard complaints procedure goes to a licensee and if or to the advisor first then to the licensee and if they're not satisfied with that then to financial ombudsman service um, or super complaints tribunal so there isn't you know in terms of the statutory requirement then you've got ASIC sitting separately as a regulator so we don't play a huge role which is why we don't have a, a huge number of complaints except around the ethical standards of advisors <coughs> so what is the role that you think you can play so at the moment we play a role in terms of the ethical um, and behavioral standards of advisors yes but what's the role that you're moving towards to um, to continue that but more formally through a code monitoring scheme do you see this co-regulatory function as becoming one of your key functions? Uh, definitely. And you said earlier when I asked you about key functions that your primary function was to promote the value of financial advice. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible for an organisation to exist both for the purpose of promoting the value of financial advice and for the purpose of regulating those who provide financial advice? Yes, I think so. How? Uh, I think that if you're looking, I don't see there's a separation. You can prom promote the value of financial advice to the community. You can still in, um, enforce upon the participants in the advice. So you can still regulate the advisors themselves. But it, doesn't it damage your promotion of the financial advice industry if at the same time you're imposing sanctions on people in a regulatory? No, I think it enhances it because you are the ones making the decision. You are the ones ensuring that those advisors who are out there representing financial advisors or pre representing the AFA or representing their peers are professionals and are doing the right thing by their clients. Do you think that members of the public would have reason to doubt whether you are the appropriate body to do that when your primary function is to promote financial advisors? I don't think the public can expect us to be the primary body responsible for financial advisors in the current environment. No, I do expect that the public would see that um, we are a professional association that does advocate for advice, that does advocate for appropriate changes to help, <coughs> um, help people and to help people in their financial need. So do you see a tension between those two roles, the role of promoting financial advice and financial advisors and regulating financial advisors? I think we've already seen that there can be tension in those relationships, yes. Yes, you accept that there is a tension. Yes. Which will make it difficult for you to act as a co-regulator of financial advisors. I think it will change the, I think it will change the role and the perception and um, I guess the way that, that the association is perceived. You've told us in your statement about the number of members that the AFA has had in each year since 2013. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, that's increased from 1,925 members in 2013 yes. to 4,291 members in 2018. That's right? Um, what was that last number? 4,291. These figures are from yes. page four of your yep. statement. Yes. And the number of members who are practising financial advisors has increased from 1,405 in 2013 to 3,576 yes. in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, not all of your members are financial advisors? Correct. Uh, at the moment, about 700 of your 4,291 members are not practising financial advisors. Correct. So that's about a sixth of your membership? Yes. So who are those other members? They could be participants in the financial advice community that um, are planning to be advisors, uh, as in they're studying to be advisors. Uh, could be participants who work for um, financial services organisation, licensees, uh, product providers, um, anyone who has an interest in, in financial advice. But the practitioner members are the ones identified as those qualified to provide advice. We see from the tables on the screen that the number of 
practising financial advisors who are your members has increased from about 6.4 per cent of the total population of financial advisors yes. in 2013 to about 14 per cent in yes. 2018. What's brought about that growth in membership? Uh, I think we've seen a growth in membership across the board. I think we've seen a growth, um, obviously, growth in advisors, but also it comes back to what you referred to earlier in the AFAs. Uh, seen increasingly to be uh, a broader association that um, uh, advisors of all types would um, would like to join. Has the AFA actively promoted membership over that period? Um, I think we always promote membership. And you're looking to continue to grow your membership into the future? Yes, we are. Uh, and what do you think are the key reasons that financial advisors might choose to become members of the AFA? I think it's, um, there's a number of reasons. There's obviously being a member of a professional association, um, that's deemed important. I think we also need to recognise that a lot of financial advisors are small business operators. So a financial um, profession like the AFA gives them a community, gives them a community to participate in, to learn, which is why we place a lot of focus on our conference and our roadshows where um, we provide professional development, but they also come together and learn from their peers. Does the AFA compete with uh, other industry organisations for its members? Um, when you say compete, we have members who are members of other associations mm -hmm. and we have members who are singly members of the AFA, as yeah. there would be members of the FPA that are not members of the AFA. But do you accept that you compete with the FPA uh, for members? Sometimes a choice is made by a financial advisor as to whether to be your member or an FPA member. Correct. Um, and as I say, sometimes they join both because they find value, different value in different associations. Probably both with the same core of professionalism and ethics and then the rest is around that, that community. Can the AFA operate effectively as a co-regulator of the financial advice industry if it's in competition with other industry bodies for membership? Um, I believe so. How? Um, I'm not sure how not. How can an organisation that is seeking to make itself attractive to potential members in comparison with other industry bodies mm -hmm. also, at the same time as seeking to make itself attractive, regulate the conduct <coughs> of those members? Um, uh, isn't there an inherent conflict in those two propositions? Um, I don't think so. Um, Mr Kewen, do you think it's more desirable for a regulator or a co-regulator to be independent of the industry that it regulates? I guess I'm looking at through the lens of what we know is in terms of the pro professional standards and what's proposed under the Financial Advisor Standards and Ethics Authority and the fact that you can have multiple code schemes and bodies issued. And so I'm looking at it through that lens. And from the moment that I walked in the door at the AFA, one of the objectives was that um, if it's in the best interest of our members, we become a code monitoring scheme, code monitoring body. Do you agree that an important aspect of the regulation of any profession is a strong system of professional discipline? Yes. Um, I want to ask you some questions about your disciplinary systems mm -hmm. at the AFA. Uh, you set out in your statement uh, the main ways that professional conduct issues come to the attention of the yes. AFA. Um, and you've pointed out in your statement at the moment, neither ASIC nor licensees report conduct issues involving members of the AFA to the AFA. Correct. Um, to your knowledge, do any licensees require their financial advisors to be members of the AFA? Not exclusively the AFA, no. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you say in your statement that the AFA only finds out information about misconduct by a financial advisor who's one of your members from ASIC after it's made a public announcement like a, a media release? Correct. And you typically learn of misconduct issues with your members as a result of reviewing media articles and uh, public announcements by ASIC? That's right. Uh, sometimes you get complaints? Yes. 
Has the AFA asked ASIC to notify it when ASIC receives a report of compliance concerns about one of its members? We've had discussions with ASIC about this and the response is that they cannot um, under uh, confidentiality because the investigation is ongoing. So does the AFA want to know about compliance concerns about its members at the earliest opportunity? I think it would be advantageous. But I also recognise due process. If there's an ongoing investigation, and this is why obviously ASIC can't tell us at the moment, because it is an, an investigation, and unless something's found, um, it is, it's quite difficult. Has the AFA asked any licensees to notify it when uh, the licensee suspends or terminates uh, an AFA member as a result of compliance concerns? We have one formal agreement in place. So you have, have one, one formal, formal agreement, agreement and who is that agreement with? Uh, with CBA. Why do you not have formal agreements with other licensees, Mr Kewen? Uh, I don't know. I can't answer that. And how did that formal agreement with CBA come to be? Uh, that was before my time, so I'm sorry I can't answer that. Since 2013, how many complaints has the AFA received about the conduct of its members? Uh, well, we've received f um, 15 complaints. 15 complaints over the last five years? Yes. Um, why do you think that number's so low? I think it comes... Um, a lot of it comes back to what I said earlier insofar as that the standard complaints process and if you, if you look at the ASIC website, uh, the ASIC website will direct customers um, through the process of talking to their advisor first, then their licensee and if they're not satisfied there, then through one of the uh, dispute resolutions. So it's not embedded that talking to a financial, um, uh, an advisor association is the first port of call. So most people aren't aware of the disciplinary function of the AFA? Unless they go to the AFA website, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, could I take you to exhibit two of your statement, which is AFA 0001 0002 0029, which is the bylaws of the AFA? Mm -hmm. Uh, and could I ask you to turn to 0038 and 0039? So clause 49 onwards sets out the AFA's disciplinary procedures. Yes. And we see at 0038 that some disciplinary matters are dealt with by the board. Mm -hmm. Uh, and some are dealt with by the disciplinary committee. Correct. And we see from clause 49 that where the board becomes aware that a member has been convicted of certain sorts of offences or disqualified from managing corporations or banned from providing financial services or expelled from membership of another professional association, the board can seek written evidence about that matter? Yes. And if the board's satisfied that the member falls into one of those categories, it can terminate membership, suspend membership or reprimand the member? Correct. Would you agree that the kinds of misconduct that might result in a criminal conviction or a disqualification from managing corporations or banning from providing financial services uh, are very serious? Uh, yes. So why doesn't the AFA just automatically terminate the membership of someone who's engaged in that sort of misconduct? Um, that would be more dealt with through um, a disciplinary committee. Well, why, why, why can the board, given you've empowered the board to exercise those powers, not exercise them immediately? The board delegates authority to a member review committee mm -hmm. and the member review committee is able to then swiftly take action if necessary. All right. Well, let, let's look then uh, at the way the AFA has dealt with one of its members. Could I ask that you um, be shown AFA 0001 
Oh, I'm sorry, we have that now. Uh, now, this is a summary of issues that relates to one of your members whose name is Mr Tyndall. Yes. And we see on this page, at, in the first paragraph, that on the 13th of January last year, another AFA member alerted the AFA office to Mr Tyndall having been banned by ASIC and expelled from the FPA for alleged misleading conduct regarding life insurance policies he had advised on several years earlier when he was in his early years advising and while he was under Securitors AFSL. Mr Tyndall is recorded as now being with Syncron. So, pausing there firstly, mm -hmm. the AFA found out about the banning of one of its members um, from another member contacting the AFA office. Is that right? Yes. So the AFA didn't identify for itself that a banning order had been made by ASIC in relation to one of its members? That seems to be the case, yes. Does the AFA have processes in place to identify when its members are banned by ASIC? Normally we do, yes. Um, what are those processes, Mr Kewen? Well, we have um, at least three people who are on the ASIC, um, uh, the ASIC reporting register, so they should receive those normally. So having been informed of this by one of your other members, on the 24th of January, the AFA contacted Mr Tyndall over the phone and he confirmed the banning. He advised at that time he was seeking a stay, a temporary delay of the banning, until the AAT was able to hear a full appeal. He did not elaborate on the issues that led to the ASIC investigation, other than to say that he felt the process had been unfair. You see that? Yes. Um, and then on the 10th of February 2017, Mr Tyndall initiated contact to advise that the AAT had just declined his application for a stay, and he'd implemented measures in the meantime to ensure his clients remained serviced. Yes. Now, uh, if we could turn to 0070, the following page, we see that despite the fact that Mr <coughs> Tyndall had been banned by ASIC, the corporate regulator, and expelled from the FPA, um, the AFA seemed unsure about what to do with Mr Tyndall. The AFA my understanding, I, again, I wasn't there at the time, but my understanding was that um, Mr Tyndall had indicated that he was appealing and that that was still underway. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the issues presented in this issues paper was whether the AFA should conduct its own investigation into the alleged conduct that formed the basis for the banning order. Yes. So why did the AFA consider that it might need to conduct its own investigation if Mr Tyndall had been banned by ASIC? I think that was just one consideration. Well, an investigation was conducted, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. Uh, tender this document, Commissioner. AFA summary of issues, read Tyndall, AFA 0001, 0003, 0069 is exhibit 2.231. Uh, the investigator's report is AFA 0001 0003 0079. Have you seen this document before, Mr Kewen? Uh, yes. It's coming Sorry. up. Yes. Well, the first one I did. <laughs> Have you seen this document before with the investigating officer's recommendation? Perhaps if we could have um, 0080 on the screen as well. What I want to put to you is that the investigator's report relies very heavily on ASIC's banning order and the FPA's determination. Yes. And we see that the investigating officer's recommendations uh, are at the bottom of that second page. In ASIC's view, there appears to have been several instances of misleading conduct designed to get clients to switch their superannuation. ASIC's conclusions of misrepresenting a person's medical history are quite compelling. The FPA determination indicates that he did not provide the FPA with a consistent or fully frank reason 
why evidence presented by the client suggested he had actually been in her account when he said he wasn't. As compelling as it is to rely upon a clearly detailed FPA investigation and a likely detailed ASIC investigation that Mr Tyndall should have his AFA membership terminated and he be removed from the register, making such a conclusion on the say-so of other parties without forming an independent view from the same evidence can be likened to accepting hearsay as it relies upon second-hand evidence. At this point in time, I do not recommend Mr Tyndall's membership be terminated. Instead, I would recommend that the committee recommend to the board that his practitioner membership be suspended until he becomes authorised by another licensee on the basis that he does not currently meet the criteria for his practitioner membership. And we see over the top, uh, at the top of the next page, 0081, that the investigating officer notes that the banning order doesn't just prohibit him from providing advice, but any financial service for five years. I recommend that we can make approval of any future membership application or lifting of suspension conditional on him providing further details about why the FPA expelled him and why ASIC banned him. We may also wish to consider contacting the FPA and ASIC in the meantime or at that later date to ask for other information about their investigations, but they may be unwilling or unable to provide anything. This may take some stakeholder management at a higher management level to convince either organisation on the merits of releasing information to us. Now, if Mr Tyndall wasn't eligible for practitioner membership and had been banned from providing financial services, why would the AFA retain him as a member? Well, his membership was suspended. Mm -hmm. um, the investigator talked about the stakeholder management that would be required at a higher level to convince either organisation on the merits of releasing information to us. Do you think that ASIC doesn't see merit in sharing information with the AFA? Um, I'm not sure. There's, there's two aspects there. I'm, I'm not sure what that actually means. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think there's merit in sharing ASIC sharing information with the AFA, yes. Do you think that ASIC sees merit in sharing information with the AFA? Yes. Does the FPA share information with the AFA? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Why not? Um, I believe not while well, there's an ongoing investigation. Uh, all right, so these are the investigating officer's recommendations. I want to take you to the result, but I tender that document. AFA investigating officer's recommendation, read Tyndall, FPA, uh, 0001, 0003, 0079, exhibit 2.232. If we turn to AFA 000. AFA should have been the uh, designation of the doc ID. AFA 0001, 0003, 0079. Sorry, Ms. Hall. No, I'm sorry, Commissioner. If we turn to AFA 0001 0003 0071, we see the um, report of the Membership Review Committee that considered this recommendation. While that's coming up, Mr. Kewen, the Membership Review Committee um, is established by the board to provide reports and advice to the board, is that right? It has delegate authority to the board mm -hmm. to act on its behalf. And uh, if you could look at 0077 in this document. We see there is reference in the middle of the page to Mr Tyndall and the fact he's been expelled from the FPA and banned by ASIC for five years from providing financial services, recorded here as from providing financial advice. Yes. And above that, we see a reference to another member whose name has been redacted, who had also been expelled by the FPA for alleged academic misconduct while completing the CFP4 exam. Yes. See that? And that advisor had been terminated by their licensee, which was NAB Financial Planning. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the committee considered what to do about both of those members and the committee's view was that it was open to the board to terminate, suspend, reprimand or take no action in relation to those advisers. Yes. Do you see that reference to the options there? Yes. Uh, and having gone through those options, if we could have 0078 on the screen at the same time, we see the consideration by the committee of the risks associated with those actions. Taking no action or anything less than suspension or termination represents a significant reputational risk to the AFA because both members have attracted substantial media attention following the FPA reporting their expulsions in the trade press. As both have not objected to suspension of their memberships, there is little risk in suspending their memberships. As both members have indicated they have legal representation, terminating their memberships could result in lengthy and costly reviews of those decisions, both within the AFA and possibly through court. Board action requested for decision, approve the recommendations to suspend the memberships of Mr Tyndall and the other member. So it seems, uh, Mr Kewen, that the board was being asked to make its decision about disciplinary sanctions for these two members on the basis of what would create the least reputational risk to the AFA. I, I see what's written there. I don't think the board would the, would make the decision based on that, but I can see what's written there. Well, that's what this document records as what was put to them. Yes. Do you have any reason to believe that they made their decision on some different basis? Uh, I guess I'm only thinking through the, the way I would look at it. Okay. Um, the point of a disciplinary procedure is to enforce standards of conduct, isn't it, Mr Kewen? Yes. And how can the AFA hope to be an effective co-regulator of the financial advice industry if it makes its disciplinary decisions based on what will cause the least risk to the AFA's reputation? I don't think all decisions are based on that. I think these two decisions were based on the fact that the important thing was to suspend the members. So the members were no longer considered to be active members of the AFA. Well, the important thing was to terminate the members to expel them, wasn't it, Mr Kewen? In both cases, I believe the the essence was to also try and follow due process. The Darren Tyndall AAT... Sorry, to try what process? Due process in terms of um, Darren Tyndall's appeal is still, um, is still reserved and the other member, as I say, was suspended. So if an ASIC banning order isn't enough, what does it take to get expelled from the AFA? In this case, as I say, because there's an appeal pending, rather than undertaking an additional investigation, uh, the, in terms of risk, the risk is the fact that if you suspend the member, they're no longer an active member. And so termination might have had longer, uh, longer term consequences. So in this case, the decision was to suspend the member. Tender that document, Commissioner. AFA Membership Review Committee Report, Re Tyndall and Other Matters, AFA 0001, 0003, 0071, Exhibit 2.233. Could I take you back to the bylaws, Mr Kewen, which are Exhibit 2 uh, to your statement, and if we could turn to 0038 and 0039 again. Um, As uh, you said earlier, these are the provisions that set out the AFA's disciplinary procedures. Yes. And we've already seen that some disciplinary matters are dealt with by the board. Uh, and where the board becomes aware that a member may have engaged in conduct that doesn't meet one of the criteria in Clause 49, but instead breaches the AFA's constitution or code of conduct, um, or the member's engaged in conduct that's discreditable to the AFA, or may not be a fit and proper person to be a member of the AFA, the board can appoint an investigating officer. Yes. And after conducting an investigation, the investigating officer can request the board to convene a disciplinary committee, uh, and the matter can then be referred to the disciplinary committee. Yes. Um, the disciplinary committee is appointed by the board? 
Yes. Uh, and who sits on that disciplinary committee? Uh, the disciplinary committee is made up of three people, one of which has to be a, a um, AFA director. So the disciplinary committee is not independent of the AFA? It's usually comprising of AFA members. Has the AFA considered setting up a disciplinary body that is independent of the AFA? Uh, yes, we have. And why haven't you done that? Um, predominantly because we haven't had a huge amount of complaints. It is something that we are aspiring to. We have looked at that journey to uh, professional standards and this is another area, but as I say, we haven't had that many complaints. We've only had two disciplinary actions in the last five years. Yes, so over the last five years, you've had two complaints or other professional conduct matters mm -hmm. that were referred to the disciplinary committee. Correct. And both of those matters led to a hearing and a, deter a determination, excuse me, by the disciplinary committee. Yes. Um, and you've given some details about those matters on page 15 of your statement. And if we turn to page 15. Uh, we see that one of them involved an inaccurate representation of a professional designation and a specialist qualification. What, yes. what, what does that mean, Mr. Hewan? <coughs> uh, that person was representing themselves to have qualification they didn't have. And the other involved inappropriate use of language in a communication with another member. Yes. And in both cases, the penalty was a reprimand. Yes. So does the disciplinary committee of the AFA have any experience in dealing with disciplinary matters arising from the provision of financial advice? Um, other than understanding the requirements of providing financial advice and adhering to um, everything that they need to adhere to, but they have no experience with dealing with any disciplinary matter connected with the provision of, dis of, of financial advice? No formal experience, no. All right. Uh, Mr Kewen, can I take you to the AFA's most recent annual report for the year ended 30 June 2017, which is uh, Exhibit 16 to your statement, AFA 0001 0003 0831. Sorry, I'll get the correct document ID for that. I'm sorry, I had the document ID correct. It's not Exhibit 16 to your statement. Is this a document that you did exhibit to your statement, Mr Kewen? Yes. Yes, I think I had the exhibit number wrong. But in any event, we have the document here. Uh, and at uh, 0850... You set out the AFA's um, income and expenses. Yes. And we see there that the AFA's revenue for the year ended 30 June 2017 was about $4.8 million. Yep. And if we turn to note two in the statement at 0858, we can see that just under $2 million of that figure came from membership subscriptions and just over $2 million came from income from conferences and functions. Yes. And if we go back to 0850, <coughs> we see that the main expense for the AFA uh, is staff employment, which is about one8 million dollars which includes professional and um, plus professional service fees yes so professional service fees uh, are a, a separate line item there mr kewen yes so staff employment expenses are the biggest expense at 1.8 million and the next biggest expense after that is your conferences road shows and events yes so what part of these expenses 
represents the AFA's spending on its disciplinary function? The majority of the professional services fees pays for um, the what was at times at the time we had contractors um, in the professional services area that oversaw that operation. So you say that's the majority of the um, seven hundred and ninety odd thousand dollar line item. Uh, yes. So, uh, does the AFA make any significant investment in its disciplinary function, Mr. Kewen? Other than the spending on the professional services and any legal costs outside of that. Plus the fact whatever we spend on the conference income, the conference revenue, those sorts of things, that all includes uh, professional development, that all includes content on ethics, um, all includes you know, other professional uh, development activities. Yes, but that's not your disciplinary function, no. is it, Mr Kewen? No. Um, over the course of these hearings, uh, we've heard evidence about a number of advisers who've engaged in um, conduct that's led to their employment or authorised representative status being terminated by yes. licensees, uh, or they've resigned after allegations of misconduct, and they included Mr John Doyle, Mr Chris Harris and Ms Jennifer Coleman. Mm -hmm. Are each of those individuals members of the AFA? Uh, I think... Uh uh, I don't think Jennifer Coleman is. Jennifer Coleman was previously a member yes. of the AFA, and Mr. Doyle and Mr. Harris are current. Yes. And uh, members at the time of the AFA. Correct. Uh, and did the licensees of any of those financial advisers report their concerns about them to the AFA? No, not to my, no my knowledge, no. And what do you think, Mr Kewen, about the fact that AFA, the AFA has members whose employment has ended as a result of misconduct and the AFA is not aware of that? Um, I'm not that comfortable with it. And do you think the public regard the AFA as an appropriate body to make a complaint to if they have an issue with a financial advisor? I'd like to think they would, yes. Do you think they do? I don't think the public know the most, a lot of the public wouldn't know that the association exists. Uh, thank you. Um, we're still trying to uh, clarify whether that uh, annual report, Mr Kewen, was an annexure uh, to your exhibit. I thought it was. You think it is. Um, Mr Hoskin thinks it's, Hosking thinks it's not. So out of an, an abundance of caution, I'm going to tender that document uh, Commissioner. AFA annual report, year ended 30 June 17, AFA 0001 0003 0831 becomes exhibit 2.234. I have no further questions, Commissioner. Thank you. Does any party other than AFA seek uh, leave to examine this witness? Very well. Have you anything that uh, you wish to... A few questions, Your Honour. Yes. Um, Mr Kewen, what's your understanding of the proposed role of a code monitoring body under the proposals which have been put forward by FASEA? Uh, to oversee the FASEA code and to monitor and, and discipline accordingly. And that code addresses what issues? That, that code will address what issues? That, well, it depends on the finalis finalisation of the code. There's only a draft at the moment. Yes. And there was um, the second member, the one that was unnamed, were there any mitigating reasons why uh, you decided to suspend him rather than terminate his membership? Um, my understanding is, I, I don't know, my understanding is he was a young member, he was very keen, he disputed um, the, the, um, the report from uh, the FPA um, on the basis that he was supposedly um, colluding with another student and that student hadn't been reprimanded. Thank you. Nothing further. Yet. Yes. Thank you. Ms Orr, is there anything no, rising out you, of that? No, Well, thank you, Mr Kewan, for your evidence. You may step down. You are excused further attendance. Uh, Commissioner, the next witness is Mr McMaster. Would the Commissioner um, uh, allow us a moment again uh, to rearrange the bar table? Yes, of course. Uh, if I come back at uh, half past... Midday. Thank you, Commissioner.